actions that we perform will require heating and when we have a sealed system or where we need to use nitrogen um, there's some things to be aware of. Um, one of those is that uh, we want to be able to make sure that we're raising our heat source to our um, apparatus. So in this case I'm just going to show that using a simple water bath and then we would want to raise our heat source to the apparatus and have the liquid, so our heating medium, in this case water, to be at the level of our solution in our flask. So hopefully that, that can be seen there. And we could initiate also our stirring and our heat. Um, once we begin heating our reaction, it's important that we put a nitrogen bubbler in place. So uh, we would want that in place here. And that will allow gases to escape as the reaction heats up and the gases inside expand. Um, we'll also want to make sure that once we lower the heat or remove the heat source and let the um, and, and let the apparatus cool that we um, engage our nitrogen flow so that as the apparatus cools and it shrinks it doesn't bring atmosphere in with it and spoil our reaction. Um, if we don't do that, you'll see the bubbler here will draw oil up the tube and begin to kind of pull the oil back up and try to pull it into your reaction. If you have your bubbler attached, but no, um, no inner gas flow as the reaction cools. And then also the rubber bands are uh, very important during the heating phase so that when as the reaction warms up, if pressure builds anywhere, the the, rub, the glass joint can pop and then re return to the position, so we don't have pieces of glass flying off and um, the reaction being exposed to atmosphere. So one of the other ways that we can heat things in the lab is just on the hot plate directly. However, this only is really useful for things with flat bottoms, like a beaker. So um, some hot plates have. Um, stirring as well. So this is one of the types that are available in the lab. So you have the dial to adjust the stirring, and then the dial here to adjust the heating, and it just goes from low, which basically is one through to high, which is seven. And those numbers are just kind of arbitrary. So that will be one way that can be, things can be heated in the lab. There's also this type that are a bit smaller. They also have the stirring capability as well as heating which goes from 1 to 10. Um, you'll just have to kind of guess to know what the actual temperature of that is or you know of course you use a thermometer or a thermocouple another kind that's in the lab is this kind which have digital dials this will read an error for the stirring portion but the temperature it actually gives you a number. However, for most th stir plates like this, this number doesn't necessarily correspond to the actual temperature of the hot plate unless you have a thermocouple attached. So you will need to have a thermocouple attached to be able to use this function for these kind of digital readout temperatures properly um, with the thermostat. You can get kind of some that the thermocouple will we give information back to this and so you can set a specific temperature and it will regulate at that temperature. However, the thermocouples are a separate uh, attachment for the hot plates and without them, this dial just functions as a much like the kind of 1 to 10 or 1 to 7 feature. There are also um, hot plates that don't have stirring. Um, they're usually pretty small. I don't have one to show in here. And then also there are just stir plates, but those aren't really used for heating, so they're not uh, as important part of this discussion. So in the lab, there are lots of different times where we'll need to heat the reaction that we're performing. And uh, what the, the method that we use to heat that reaction is determined by our setup, the size of it, and uh, other things, as well as how hot we need to get it to. 
So one of the simplest ways that we can heat um, an apparatus is a water bath. So we have here our hot plate, and one of the things we'll need to do is add a stir bar to our water bath here. And then we can turn on the heat and the stirring. And the stirring will help us ensure that the um, water heats nice and uniformly. Another thing is we can add a thermometer, like this one, on a stand. And if we put that in the water, but not touching the bottom, clamp that in place, that will give us the kind of best reading of our um, water bath. And then one important thing is that we don't try to move our um, apparatus down to our heat but if we have you'll notice that I have this hot plate um, on a lab jack and that allows us to raise I've actually got my thermometer too low that allows us to raise our heating to our flask It's important to know how um, full our bath is going to be, and this will be more important for other types of, uh, of baths that we'll get to. But we want the level of our um, heating medium, so water in this case, to be higher or at the same level than the solution in our flask that we're heating. And we want to be sure that we're not going to overflow our bath and spill it onto the hot plate or in our hood. So similar to using a water bath, an oil bath uses a dish like this with oil in it. Um, with water, we're limited to the boiling point of water, so around 100 degrees C. But if we use mineral oil, we can get up to about 150 degrees C before the oil starts to smoke. And with silicone oil, which is what we have here, we can get up to 250 degrees before that will start to smoke. Um, Again, just as with water baths, it's important that we use it, that we raise the um, bath up to our uh, flask that's gonna be heated instead of the other way around, especially if we have some larger apparatus here, which is common, that gets a lot more tricky if you have multiple clamps involved. Um, I have a paper clip here in this bath to stir it. It's important to stir the bath here so that it um, can evenly heat the oil so that we don't get uh, any kind of problems coming from uneven heating. Um, so if we wanted to um, heat this pink solution here to, I don't know, a specific temperature, we would want to raise it up to so that the level of the oil is even or above the level of our solution, which it looks like. And sometimes that can be hard to tell, um, but that's how we would want it. And because of that, we wanna make sure that we don't have our oil level too high in the, um, the dish, such that once we get it, um, get our flask submerged in there, that it overflows. And also remember that the oil will expand as it heats. So you wanna make sure that you have some headroom here for that expansion as you heat your oil. And as with water bath, if we want to know the temperature of our oil, we can use a thermometer like this one. Sneak it in the side here. We also though don't want it to touch the bottom of the bath that will help us get the most accurate temperature. And it's important to not stir our oil baths with the thermometer and to avoid using mercury thermometers with oil baths as they can get hot enough to break them. With oil baths, especially if you're using them when it's hot, you know, in a, when you really need them hot or hotter than 100 degrees, uh, like a hotter than a water bath, it's very helpful to be able to raise the heat to your flask. Um, this also allows you to drop your heat away and let the oil, excess oil drip off your flask before moving on to the next step of your reaction. So 
When we're not using an oil bath, we can set it aside off of our hot plate and just make a simple cover out of aluminum foil to cover it with. And that will keep dust and other things out of it so that it stays um, good for as long as possible. We don't have to replace that oil, provided we don't uh, heat it too hot. But when an oil bath begins to look dark like this, and you might be able to see as well, this one is kind of congealed a bit, especially on the bottom. This larger one as well. It's quite chunky. There's also, I think, some screws or some things that have fallen in here. These baths are no longer suitable to use and should be disposed of. Um, this bottle has been kept to um, receive waste oil bath oil and other kinds of oil so we can get rid of that if your oil bath gets to be kind of a yellow or a tan color or even a, a slight brown color that's still usable um, it's when the oil is starting to separate or has clumps or other um, things like that that you want to get rid of it so yeah this oil is separated rather badly and has a lot of brown loopy stuff on the bottom. So I'll scrape the rest of that out and move on to the next thing. So another way that we can heat things in the lab is with a heating mantle and a variac. <clears throat> and that's what this device here is. So the variac is a power supply for the heating mantle and it gives us a control of the output of the uh, heating mantle. So heating mantles consist of a series of wires uh, inside this insulating mesh fabric that when the currents pass through them heat up, the wires do. Um, heating mantles would be raised, again, just like with an oil bath, to envelop your flask. This flask is a bit undersized, or this mantle is oversized for this flask. Um, heating mantles do have the disadvantage of sometimes having localized hot spots within them due to just the placement of the um, heating wires inside there. And one way that we can um, kind of mitigate that, the effect of heating of hot spots or to use a larger mantle for a smaller item is sand. Um, sometimes we'll just call this a sand bath. So we simply fill up our heating mantle with some sand. our flask and kind of like much like we would with the water bath we want the sands to be kind of all around our flask so backfill around the flask Heating mantle seed up pretty slowly. It takes about 20 minutes, really, before they see much of a change from room temperature sand. So it's something to be aware of when you're planning to use one. Uh, a note on Variax, they often have, uh, they have a switch on them to turn them on and off, on and off, and then the dial on the top what determines the power output. Um, I've heard it said that Variax can generate sparks, 
and in some instances that's a bad idea to be near your um, experiment so it's a good idea to have your variac outside of your hood to prevent any accidental ignitions. So another way that we can conveniently heat things in the lab is with a heat gun, which looks like this. Um, some are different, but they're basically a giant souped up hair dryer, um, but they're considerably more dangerous than a hair dryer. Um, the switch here has uh, kind of three positions. So you have an off, you have the cold salute position, which just blows air. So the, the uh, cold position only blows air and then the hot position will blow hot air. One important thing is that after you've run the heat gun on the hot setting for a while, it's important to run it on cold again to uh, cool down the elements so that the next person uses it or if it's near something it doesn't uh, cause any problems or hurt someone or cause a fire so. running the heat gun on cold again after hot helps i think to prolong the life of the um, elements inside that heat up It should also be noted that it's, you should be carefully using a heat gun around any um, really volatile solvents that are flammable because you, you can quickly turn your heat gun into a flamethrower if you're blowing um, solvent vapors away and then they're catching fire because they're getting hot enough to ignite. Another method with, for heating that we have in the lab is a Bunsen burner. Now you have to have a gas hookup for that but in places where that is available, Bunsen burners are often too. Um, Bunsen burners can be used to do things like heat test tubes. Um, also, they're useful for um, making capillary tubes to do NMR samples or other things where you might need to do a capillary tube or to seal um, ampules. One of the things that we can use a Bunsen burner for is to flame dry glassware. So if we have a piece of glassware that's got um, water or solvent in it, we can get rid of that by heating it over a Bunsen burner to drive off that vapor on the inside of it. And it's important to wear uh, some kind of protective glove while doing this so that you can safely handle the piece of glassware around the flame. Carefully though, without lighting your glove on fire, 